Hello, everybody. I am Callie Francois, and welcome to Learn Horse Racing, where we take a peek over the shoulder of the top horse players in the world as they handicap a race. A deep dive into the details as experts really show us their work, their techniques, and all the handicapping tools they use. This week, we feature the amazing Jessica Paquette, public handicapper extraordinaire and current handicapper and paddock analyst at both Sam Houston Racetrack and Colonial Downs. Not to mention, she is also the Director of Communications for the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, former VP of Marketing at Suffolk Downs, and an accomplished rider herself who jokes that her life is run by her two retired racehorses. What a trippy and Puget sound. I'm excited for this. Let's go ahead and meet Jessica. Here we go. Um, hello to everyone. Welcome to LearnHorseRacing.com. I am your host, Callie Francois. And here I have with me for our first show is none other than the lovely public handicapper, Jessica Paquette. Now, Jessica is currently a uh, public hand handicapper for uh, Colonial Downs, Sam Houston. And uh just in general, a public handicapper. Jess, uh, how are you doing? I, you know, I'm great. How about you? Thanks for having me. I think this is a lot of fun. I'm a big believer in show your work as a handicapper. So I think this will be a fun way for people to get inside inside the mind, whether they want to or not. Yes, we, you know, taking a peek over the shoulder of the best handicappers uh, in the sport. Let's dig in to uh, the race that we're going to chat about today. So uh, Jess, again, guys, we're going to be peeking over Jess's shoulder and she's going to be showing us on the screen how she thinks, how her mind works. And so we're going to start at Gulfstream Race 8 on December 17th. Uh, for us, that's a Friday, I believe. Uh, but then just going over, this is a claiming 15, not more than two for life, a mile and 16th on the turf down there at uh, sunny Florida. And just uh, before we get into it, overall, how do you describe your handicapping philosophy as a whole? If you could describe your handicapping style in two, three sentences, give it to me. I think at the end of the day, I'm a horse person, not a numbers person. And I understand that there is a real place for the, num uh, for the numbers part and the speed figures and all of that. And I take those things into consideration, but ultimately at the end of the day, horses don't read the daily racing form or they don't read the thoroughbred numbers or whatever sheets you like. So I think you need to take each horse as an individual on each individual day. And I've learned, I've been doing this for a long time. I started at Suffolk Downs um, over 15 years ago now. And Oh, the best. Um, yeah. But nothing can make you look dumber in about a minute and a half than a racehorse. So, you know, you really have to take yeah, each horse absolutely. as an individual. Yes. No, I absolutely love that um, because I do look at horses that just, I'm a horse girl myself, so I look at it the same way. Again, there's something to be said for numbers, algorithms, absolutely. But uh, taking it, you take it back to the base, you take it back to the horse, which is exactly uh, what we're going off of. These are not machines. They're not robots. These are actual live animals. And that's how you look at it, at it which uh, that's something I absolutely appreciate it. So, you know, you use, there's a wider range, speaking of algorithms, there's a wide range of tools that people can use. What are the tools uh, that you typically use when you're handicapping a race before you get into the paddock? So I'm a little old school. I like a uh, daily race and form classic past performances. I like to keep it a little simple. For me, when I have too many options and kind of make sometimes too much information, I have a hard time maybe discerning what's the most useful to me at that moment. So I like to keep it really very simple. I like a good set of DRF past performances and I'm a pedigree nerd. So I always have my pedigree query window open. And that can sometimes be why it takes me so long to handicap a race because one pedigree will lead to another. And then before you know it, I'm watching like the 1997 Breeders' Cup Classic. And I've, <laughs> I've down this like rabbit hole of being a fan too. So I do get easily distracted, which doesn't always help when I'm on a time crunch, but I do think pedigree matters. I know there are some people that think it's nonsense, but um, I think it matters. Yeah, so we're going to get into that a little bit later in the show. You're going to get to show us your pedigree category because I have loads of questions for that because I've never used that site before. But I just, I I also want to know, you know, besides the tools that you use, you know, replays, pedigree, DRF. So when you're using, you typically, what do you use first? You're looking at DRF first, correct? Yes, I'll, so I'll pull up my DRF past performances and I can share my screen now so everyone can see what I'm 
what I'm looking at here. I think this is the right, there we go. The mar marvels of modern technology, right? I so love I'll it. Pull, I'll pull up a DRF pass performance. And I also love that we're handicapping a race that doesn't have a morning line set because that's one thing that when I'm handicapping for a racetrack I'm working for, for example, like Colonial Downs this summer, I like to handicap before the morning line is out. I don't like anything to sway my opinion. So I actually prefer to look at horses just as they are. I don't really care that someone thinks they should be the, the favorite or what if this horse I like is 30 to one, then I can start, then I sometimes will start second guessing myself and be like, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm being crazy picking this horse. I get, maybe it. I I am, get it. But I like no, to kind of have a clean, great. A clean we slate. The, we love the crazy. It's fine. This is great. Gotta take a swing, right? But what I love is that you and I, I, I feel a kinship in this attitude where you need to make your opinions for yourself mm -hmm. with the information. So the morning, absolutely. The morning light odds, it can it can funk you up a little bit and make you second guess yourself. So now we're looking at the DRF uh, form here right now. What is the first? So what's the first thing that you look at when you use your first tool? What's the first thing you're going to do? Are you going to throw out? Are you throwing out horses? Are you looking at trainers? Are you looking at the pat like the um, past performance pattern? Uh, the are you looking at pedigree? What's the first thing that you do when you're looking at a race? So the first thing I do is uh, many of the time when I'm handicapping a race, I am going to be in the paddock talking about these horses. So my exercise is I will kind of go down horse by horse and make just brief first impressions for each one in the race. Sometimes Actually, that's I'm going to, oh. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're going to take it a step back. So let's, pre let's pretend right now that you have not stepped in the paddock yet. Yep. That you're looking at, so you're looking at this race even before you look at these right. horses. Right. That's, okay, so that, that's what, sure. yep, that's I, what I do is, sure. as part of my homework for preparing to kind of be in the paddock, I will got it, make, got uh, it. I will go, go down horse by horse and make just first impression notes uh, before I go got and it. do a deep dive of handicapping the race. That's how I kind so, of throw out a couple of horses. Uh, sometimes my notes are not always nice. Let's be, uh, I'll be perfectly honest. Sometimes they, they can be. They should sometimes, be, no. So when you're going through a horse, like what kind of notes, what kind of notes are you making? What's the, what's the typical first note that you make when you're looking at a horse? I won't say which trainer it was. I was doing this for a race the other day and my note simply was, ew, trainer's name, pass. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes it okay. is as, as simple as that just for, uh, you know, when I go and do a further dive into this, that this is a horse that I'm not going to really spend a lot of time um, digging it. into. Sometimes like a hard pass is a hard pass. Hard pass. So hard pass, uh, you look at, so typically you look at trainers, but um, anything else that you zero in on to basically take out a quick note on the horse when you're first looking at a horse? I try to look for like a big picture. For me, I'm kind of summarizing their body of work. That's what, that's what I view this as. Kind of of just a, like a, a broad summary. Got it. One thing that is a is a major thing for me, and I love. Um, we were talking off camera that you picked a non winners of two lifetime race for me to handicap here because I I do have a set of rules when I'm handicapping, and I try to stick with them as much as possible. And of course, you're going to break your own rules sometimes, but yeah. for the most part, I try to, to be broken. Hold, yeah, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> but like they're they're also there for a reason. I'm a little bit of a rule follower uh, occasionally, and I you know I think that if you stick true to whatever your set of rules as a handicapper are, they won't lead you wrong. Like as long as you're pretty consistent. So non-winners of two is sort of my favorite condition because I think horses can get super stuck at that level. And one of my biggest, biggest handicapping rules, less starts, the better. I know some people really veer away from a horse trying winners for the first time because the waters can be a lot deeper, but for me, it, it's a horse that hasn't lost against winners yet. And that's an angle I really like kind of um innocent until proven guilty to yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Has not absolutely. disappointed me yet. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. So let's take a look at this first one, this eyes on target. And let's get let me see your overall what's your overall gist of this horse. Okay, so we're gonna go um as you can see I like I open up notepads. Sometimes I'll do this handwritten. That kind of just depends on how what the format in which I'm doing this. So I'll just kind of yeah. write I, eyes on target. Everyone forgive my chubby fingers and my bad typing. There will be a lot of typos in this as I go quickly. Um, That's not I, what we're here for, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but eyes on target, you know, back on turf. I like, apparently my C button doesn't work. Great. Back on turf. You know, Mott, I like. So these are things that I'll just notes and on to the next one. This is a horse that I'll probably consider. Um, I don't know yet, but so far he is appealing to me. 
um, seven channels, you know, lots of starts. You know, le less starts the better at this non-winners of two lifetime condition. And his tries against winners have not been super noteworthy, but he is dropping in for attack. So maybe, um, you know, he kind of gets like a C rating for me here. Right. You know, this is, it's a tedious process, but for me, this helps me organize my thoughts it a little is. bit. So, yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not go. it's, what's great is that this is true to your philosophy is that you're looking at a horse at each horse as it is. Um, and guys, that's what she's doing. Instead of just going through the form and crossing out and rating going off of that, she's taking each horse and taking them one by one. Uh, you know, wing commander, this horse has a ton of upside to me getting blinkers on. Sometimes I like to see a horse run really abysmally and then try something different. So getting blinkers, you know, Suge always is a plus for me. And getting a little class relief here. You know, he was in some, th those races at Churchill and at Keeneland this fall were really tough. So I think I'm dropping in for 50 at Gulfstream. The okay. waters might be a little lighter for him. Correct. Yes. Um, and I'm glad you only took picked a race with seven horses because uh, these fine folks might be here all night with me. That's uh, just, it's okay. That's all right. <laughs> we're we're here. I'm here all day long. Um, so Toretto. So this is sort of an interesting horse to me. Um, you know, synthetic back to turf. Mm -hmm. uh, only second try against winners. Tried stakes company last time. Lightning rod. This is also where I get a little stuck because I'm convinced I've seen this horse run in person, which I obviously have not looking at his past performances, but he must have entered at Colonial and scratched um, yeah. with the we coming out of Jane's the belly barn. So this will left my own devices. I would be very puzzled by this and then spend a half hour trying to figure out where I thought I saw him. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, this is this is again the why this takes hours and hours. It's funny to me that people think um, some people think that public handicapping is like a really just make the pick punch the ticket and you're done. And, There's so much more to it. Exactly. Which is why uh, we're delving into exactly why you do uh, how you do things. Yeah, I was curious what you were thinking. I was curious what you were thinking of this horse. <laughs> yeah, just you, you wonder if this one maybe is just that notch below, right? Correct. Uh, la that last race was good, but he kind of doesn't necessarily look like he shows up every time either. That's Correct. the kind of horse I'd be hard pressed to key on top. Um, and then this is a group hug. This is going to be a horse where, for me, I'm very curious how this particular trainer is doing at this particular meet. Um, you kind of have to look at a bigger picture, right? Like sometimes the maker barn right. is super live and sometimes they go through some cooler streaks. Um, so far right. the maker barn looks a little chilly at Gulfstream. Correct. Yep. So then you're going, and yeah, you're, you're always on tap with what's going on across the nation all the time. I imagine you're watching races all the time. So you're just really, really, really keeping yourself on tap. So now you've gone through all these horses. Now, here's my question. How do you, so you take all these notes now, how, in your mind, how are you organizing all of this and kind of taking, you know, we're going from, let's say the bottom of the pyramid, correct? We're going from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. What are the steps up to that? What's the next step? So now I kind of get a little, I go a little rogue and there are a couple of horses here. I'm pretty intrigued by the first, the first one should source. Uh, so this is an, this is now where I go down my pedigree rabbit hole. Like, Love this horse for turf, being by gut stormy. The Friends Lake mare is sort of interesting, but now I'm curious, what has this mare produced? What has she done? Tell me more, internet. Um, this is also going to show how old I am that I still use pedigree query and I do not care. Uh, this, when I was a teenager. I was just talking to somebody very young who is still, still, don't worry, they're very aware of what pedigree query is. They still use it. So don't, don't use that word with me. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not buying it. I'm not, I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> That's all right. You know, it, it, it's experienced, not, not, you know, ready for the nursing home. Like I feel most days. Um, so from here, this is the horse who probably intrigues me the most, but I want to know kind of a little bit more here. So off to pedigree query, I go, the horse's dam's name is my darling Debbie. 
So this is quickly explain pedigree query for our listeners uh, in your own words. So it's a pedigree database. Now, it is not always 1000% accurate because it can be edited. It's like Wikipedia, essentially, for nerdy horse people. So it can be edited by the basic public. But for the most part, it's pretty legit. And um, I like being able to see a five generation pedigree. It's also free, which, you know, sometimes that's my favorite trait of something in horse racing. (laughs) Okay, so we're, this is this is pedigree query going five generations back. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, keep explaining uh, on top and on bottom what exactly that means. So you know, here here is this horse's dam all the way back in her pedigree. It also gives a little overview of her race record, and sometimes they'll put if she's been a noteworthy producer at all, but not always. So you have to keep digging. At first glance, she was not much race horse. So you can go up to reports here and see what her progeny were and see if she's okay. made anything useful. Um, one six figure earner, which curious here. You know, a decent little, you know, decent hard knocking, uh, unfortunate end, but decent hard knocking racehorse, 33 starts, four wins. Um, interesting enough to me. That's kind of, it's shown that she's produced quite a few winners as well. So this is Correct. clearly a useful mare. So now I'm a little yeah. curious more about what her relatives are. So I will go down to her dam and check mm-hmm. progeny. And the dam is on the bottom, guys. For anybody who just doesn't know, typically the sire is on the top when you see a pedigree and the dam is on the bottom. The and, mother. Ju- and just as a pet peeve thing, horses are out of the dam by the sire. Uh, yes. it's, uh, nothing drives me <laughs> crazier when someone says like the horse is out of include. No, that? no. <laughs> so again, not, not a ton in her female family either. Um, you know, th- this is again, why this takes me forever because I will just go and see what did this one do? And what did that one do? And let's see, we'll go one generation back. Why not? Let's, let's indulge. So then, yeah, not, are, okay, so you're indulging right now, Tip it, but typically yeah. you kind of just go for the dam and what she's, essentially what she's produced. Um, yeah. And so we'll, you know, what's something, obviously a dam that hasn't really produced anything, it's not going to light your, it's not going to light your fire. Sure. Um, and you're going to, and you're just going off of horses that have run very, that those half siblings that have run very, very well. Or well enough. So well now I'm going to go back. Now I'm going to go back to Wing Commander, who, while his pedigree may not have lit me on fire, um, still really interesting. So I'm going to just look at his body of work as a whole. It took him a couple of tries to break his maiden, broke his maiden on the turf at Ellis. Good effort. One thing I like at first glance, and for those of you new to past performances, italicized names mean the horse came back to win their next start. So you can often judge an inexperienced horse by the company they were keeping. And it looks like he's been keeping some pretty good company. Several horses that he's run against have come back, either broken their maiden or subsequent allowance win or something of that nature. So again, he's been keeping okay company. And you have to like this little bullet workout at Gulfstream. Um, Again, that was on the dirt, running on the turf here. But he's performed well enough on the grass that you have to think that the blinkers were on for that workout. Just exactly, and they, he's, again, you know, he's he's down there in that weather as well, so that certainly helps with it. I also prefer warm weather as, as well. Yeah. Uh, so at this point, this horse is my top my top choice, but there are still a okay. couple of other horses that I thought were kind of interesting. So we'll move on to Toretto, who really a fascinating horse here. Not a ton of pedigree on him. Um, he's a Florida bred, which uh, a big fan of the Florida breeding program. But this is not a horse that's going to have a a really impressive pedigree to him. I'll look up okay. the dam just for just for you know S's and G's, and we'll see we'll see here. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she is a top producing Florida brood mare. Let's find out. You know, she's been useful. But so this horse is kind of it's a little interesting to me here. The synthetic race I'm willing to completely toss sometimes when a horse is doing something if I was if I had these printed out in front of me I'd probably just draw a line through that okay you would so you would draw a line through Toretto's last race yep some other points to make here his best race his maiden win came when he was competing on Lasix whatever you think about Lasix he's competing against Lasix here he's competing on Lasix here as well so that's worth noting. You kind of want to look for horse for patterns with horses. I do think they do develop patterns and you try to find a way where they can replicate their best effort. What scenario does it take for this horse to have his best effort? Absolutely. And that seemed and that seemed to be with Lasix against 
made in special company on the terrific golf stream. And that does seem to be what he's doing here. So by all accounts, this is a horse who is, en- is set up to succeed. On to the next step. For so, him, at least for Toretto, for meaning for Toretto. <laughs> yep. So, the, so these two have kind of made my cut at this point. And I'm going to go all the way up to the top to the other one I liked, Eyes on Target for Mott. And this is another one. Sometimes when they run too badly, it's too bad to be true. Um, but this is a horse who's had a couple of, you know, pretty abysmal efforts in a row. So you kind of wonder what kind he is at this point. He looked like he showed some promise early on. Um, and we'll look up his pedigree as well. I mean, it's certainly turf oriented, being by exaggerator, or something curling out of a belong to me mare. I'm very curious about her. And he costs $275,000. That's, you know, not a small amount of money. Once we get to her page, I want to pause for a sec. Sure. So Christy, Christy's treasure, all of the information that's next to her above that text box, that's just what she's done. And yes. then it opens up to just more, um, in, just more information on her, maybe extra, some extra ancillary information that might be useful. So she's actually an interesting one. She broke her maiden on the turf going long, black type producer. Yeah, some, there's some class in the sources pedigree is for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, this is one who I think his pedigree may make him more appealing than he is on paper. Um, Correct. By all accounts, his race record does not, um, there's nothing in it that gives me a sense of confidence in this horse. And I do think he'll probably be a little bit over that. Uh, I do think these Mott horses going two turns on the turf sometimes get a little more attention than maybe is warranted. Right. So then, yeah, well, for a horse like this, you know, you're, you love pedigree, but for a horse in this situation, it, the pedigree might be a bit too flashy for you to believe in the horse just because yeah. of what he's done in the past. So you're going to, if you're looking at two, if you're looking at a horse that, you know, like eyes on target, who has bred very, very well, but hasn't shown um, great compared to other horses, especially in this field that aren't, you know, maybe bred as well as eyes on target, but still putting in some decent performances, you're going to pick that horse, those horses over, you know, the better bred horse typically, correct? Yeah. And I think for this horse, if particularly price matters, um, I think he's very interesting at maybe six or eight to one, five to two, not so much. Um, no. <laughs> I, I, th- I think he's one you kind of watch as the day goes on, as the board moves and see what the public thinks of him sure now seven channels again a lot of starts he certainly is the most experienced horse in this field uh 12 starts he did break his maiden relatively recently so at this point i don't think he's one that's going to be stuck at this non-winners of two lifetime level he is dropping in for a tag a lot in his favor the thing i do like the most about him this is again where i go to being a pedigree nerd these english channels what a loss it was that we lost him about a month or so ago Mm -hmm. um they're just so useful and they run forever and they get better as they get older. It wouldn't surprise me if this horse is really just starting to develop into himself this latter half of his four-year-old year. Uh, it takes, one. Yeah, it takes them, it takes them, these English channels for a number of them, a little bit of time to, you know, kind of get into it. So I agree with you completely. So seven channels, the English was his form the first thing that popped in, that popped out at you or the fact that he's an English channel that popped out at you. The English Channel and the class drop, um, and they clearly thought reasonably highly of this horse that they had him in higher level maiden races until he finally kind of got the job done. Seems to have some ability. This is for me is a horse I don't necessarily key on top, but if I'm using, if I'm playing exotics or even a horizontal, I would probably use him. I wouldn't want to get beat by him in a pick three or a pick four. Um, Correct. And, but I, I'm not entirely sure he's good enough to win, but he, he'd be kind of a defensive play for me. Okay. So then you have essentially your top four selected. Yep. And there we go. So that's it. Any of these other forces that you didn't have, you kind of, you just didn't really regret them. You focus more on the horses that just pop out at you correctly. Correct. Yeah. And I wonder if this is kind of a habit I picked up early on at Suffolk Downs. Like when, you know, when you're first starting public handicapping, you're really green and you don't want to offend anybody. So my, um, I used to be a little cautious of if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it and just, just pass on the horse and, and, and skip on the horse. Um, so you don't want to be, uh, disparaging towards something that someone's worked on, but you also do want to give the public the right amount of information. So I've gotten a little bit more confident as I've gotten older, taking a stand against, but I do, I think, I think it was a habit developed early on. Like sometimes you just, it's better not to say anything. 
in a lot of situations, not always alluding to just handicapping. Yes, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> if you can't be nice, you can at least be quiet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that those are our top picks. So Jess, just let me go. Just uh, tell us your top picks again in your order. I think you started off with Wing Commander, correct? Yep, I'm going to use Wing Commander, and I'm going to use him over Toretto, Eyes on Target, and Seven Channels. And maybe okay. Pug does get overbet and beats me, but I'm not. I think he'll probably be the favorite here, and he's not going to be on my ticket. Okay, all right, I love it. And there we go. There's our race eight at Gulfstream on Friday, which I believe is a Stronic Five race as well. So they picked a you picked a good one to handicap. So let's just go back to these maiden races again. Like, what is your process for handicapping these maiden races with mostly first-time starters? Well, I think for that, you have to make your notes, make your plan, and then expect it to change. Uh, yeah. There was uh, <laughs> there was a race at Colonial this summer that was, to me, the greatest example of that. There was a horse okay. um, of Arnaud Delacour's, Amazon Queen who on paper, I loved her pedigree, loved everything about her, but I had some questions about whether like six furlongs on the dirt was really going to be her jam. Yeah. This silly walked in. I mean, her legs were as long as I am. Um, just okay. this gangly, long, beautiful athletic filly. And I'm sure she wins the war. She was not going to win the battle that day. Uh, she actually Got broke it. her maiden going long on the turf at Tampa recently. So that's what she was meant sure to. Enough. <laughs> sure um, enough. But you have to be able to say, hey, um, I thought this sort, you know, this is not what I was expecting this horse to look like. And I still like her on paper and maybe that's enough, but physically you have to maybe look for a horse who it's their day today. Exactly. And I, that's the biggest thing, looking at the maiden for what they are in that moment, you, you're not, you're seeing potential is great, but you have to see what's in front of you at that moment. That's your biggest take on with these maiden first time starters. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and again, being, I think it's just for people starting out handicapping, just the more you look at them, the more you'll develop your own opinions. This is very nerdy. And I happily admit uh -huh. this because I do not care. My I favorite activity in high school would be to get the like the big printed copy of the Blood Horse Stallion Register and go page by page with my best friend. Uh, we were very popular. Let me say I, <laughs> I love it. But that's how you develop some opinions. It's kind of just the more you see and the more you do, you kind of begin to notice what you like um, because what I like isn't going to be what everyone likes. And sometimes you can find the same answer, but you get to that place in a lot of, of different ways. A thousand different ways to skin a cat. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. So we are done with our handicapping session, but I just want to hit you up with a few lightning <laughs> questions just to wrap this up uh, for today. So in your opinion, What's the biggest mistake people make when handicapping? Ooh, that's a good question. I think it, I, I honestly, I think it's not being comfortable being wrong. You, you have to understand that some days you're not going to be able to figure it out at all, but tomorrow's a new day. There's always another race. Um, I remember leaving Suffolk one day when I was a kid. I mean, I was like 22, just starting out there. And some little old man was like, you went over today, kid. And I went, yeah, like, sure no. did, sir. Sure no. did. But, like, ah. so did he. Uh, ah. <laughs> but oh, you, you that's do. That's vicious. That's vicious. You, oh, I mean, East Boston will toughen you right up. You'll get a thick skin real quick. But you do have to be comfortable uh, that you're not going to know all the answers. That's the biggest thing is taking your pride out of it. It's just kind of just like sitting in the saddle. So, absolutely. So we kind of covered it already, but what's your favorite type of race to handicap? If it's not the one we talked about today. Long distance maidens on the turf. Okay, lovely. And why? Those are typically the kind of pedigrees that I like. It's typically the trainers I like as well. I mean, you see a lot of, you know, these long distance, you, you see Grand Motion, you see Delacour, you see Mott and Clement and Matt and you the occasional Michael Dickinson. And those are, yeah. those are the barns that, you know, all the Fair Hill guys really that yeah. make me, that make me excited as a racing fan. Perfect. So um, we, we're talking about loving horses as well, but we also have fun making some wagers. And I love what you told me when I did uh, kind of dig into this earlier. I asked you, you know, do you bet at all? And you said, what, Jess, tell me what you say as far as your philosophy on betting. 
I am not afraid to put my money where my mouth is. Um, love it. I my, love it. My best score was the Kentucky Derby trifecta, the year maximum security got taken down because sometimes it's better oh, yeah. to be lucky than good. <sighs> I love that. That's amazing. I got to oh. lease a really nice show horse that year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So then three. So what are your what are the what's your most often wager? What are you mostly doing? When you're putting your money where your mouth is. Sometimes it is just a straight win bet. Um, and I know if you get on horse racing Twitter, there's a lot of, you know, talk about ticket construction. And that's really important. Make a smart ticket, be a smart better, but also don't feel inclined to have to, you know, play every, ev- play everything. Pick what makes what you like watching and what you like doing. So when you do, uh, you know, horizontal ticket, will you, or a vertical ticket, will you, I mean, do you do pick four, pick five, pick six? I mean, do you do supers? Which, if you're going to do a multi bet, what is it usually? Is it usually throughout the day or just a single race? I try to construct a solid pick four. Um, I also live in great fear of being made fun of on the Twitter for a stupid pick four ticket. So let me tell you, like, I look at those real hard before I post them on the internet because Twitter is vicious. Um, but I'm so vicious. Twitter is so vicious, but I, I, I do try to think of a, a smart pick for ticket. What are your favorite tracks you like to play or the ones that you most commonly play? I love Canterbury Park. Um, that I is my, love that. I love okay. Canterbury. Uh, I love Tampa. Tampa is, feels like home to me in a lot of ways, as I used to call it Suffolk down south, and now it's colonial down south. So it's a lot of familiar faces to me, and I feel very comfortable playing that, uh, playing that track. Okay, guys, you heard her first, uh, Canterbury, which I absolutely love. And <laughs> I love that you chose that. I love that you play that a lot. And uh, so, yeah, Canterbury, Tampa, Colonial. This Sam is Houston. Woman, guys, this is your woman. Um, this is and, your of course, woman. I'll, be, I'll be at Sam Houston the, yeah, this winter. So Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, you did discuss this a little bit uh, earlier in the show, but depending on your distraction factor. So let's take a distraction factor a little bit away from it, which fair enough, I have the same, I think all of us have the same issue uh, being on a computer, but how long does it typically take you to handicap an eight, nine race card? Longer than it probably has any right to, (laughs) to be honest with you. A couple of hours, uh, honestly, which I love. I mean, I can't believe that someone pays me to do that. Like a colonial, that's amazing. That never gets old to me. Um, That's the thing I will never complain about spending a couple of hours doing. Thank you so much for joining the show. It was such an honor and a pleasure to have you. Uh, And again, we might have you on later, but uh, so lovely to have you and so fun. This was so fun. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I want to thank the great Jessica Paquette again for coming on our show. That was interesting, right? So what did we learn here? Well, did you notice or find it interesting that Jessica did not once mention speed figures or pace? That's pretty different these days, right? Really rare when 90% of the people focus most on speed figures for their handicapping now. So I would categorize Jess as an overall class handicapper and a connections, mostly trainer connections handicapper with a healthy dose of pedigree focus mixed in. And of course, when she's in person at the races, she's really great at physicals and confirmation evaluation too. So how can you use this information from Jess? Well, first you can try add, adding some of these techniques to your toolbox if you're a figures or numbers player. And if you're playing any of the meets where Jess is handicapping, you can use her daily picks to cross-check against your speed and pace figure-focused handicapping. So then you'll have all of your bases covered. Jess is the public handicapper right now at Sam Houston Racetrack in the winter and Colonial Downs in the summer. So look for her and her picks at those track and simulcast feeds. And Jess can really do it. She's good. The race we handicapped here, we did a little bet for charity where we keyed her top pick with her three other choices in exactas and trifectas, and we came out profitable. As her top pick wing commander just got nipped at the wire while her other choices finished first and third to fill out the trifecta. 
and Wing Commander still leading. Wing Commander an eighth of a mile from home and two on top. Seven channels, the one taking aim second. Eyes on target, loose and charging now. He's at 16th from home and gaining good ground. Here's Eyes on target. Well handled to win it. Eyes on target was patiently handled and burst through in the lane. He ran down Wing Commander with seven channels third and group hug fourth. Not a huge return, but it was profitable. So we will be sending a little check with our profit to her favorite charity, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Uh, that's a wrap on this one. Thanks again for watching and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. This really helps. And tell your friends about our show and you can always find us at learnhorseracing.com. More amazing guests and shows coming soon to you guys. Thank you. The great Kazi flattened out in third, and never, never more. Ice T in front from Sir Orinoco as they come to the 16th pole. Ali Francois with a long shot. Ice T.